Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of The Lost Archives, a Star Wars Legends lore series. Today, we're going to be talking about the Hand of Judgment. The Hand of Judgment was a group of five Imperial Stormtroopers who deserted their post and became vigilantes. Now, there's a bit of a backstory here on why they deserted their post, so I shall start from the beginning. So, our story begins roughly six months after the Battle of Yavin with the destruction of the first Death Star. Derek Laroni and his team of three of his stormtroopers and his friend in the Scout Trooper Division were stationed on an Imperial Star Destroyer known under the designation Reprisal. They had been sent to a world that had been suspected of having a rebel cell, not knowing that before the ship had arrived the rebels had fully evacuated from the planet. So instead the Imperials decided to attack a small city that was on the planet. Uh, members of the Imperial Security Bureau ordered the accompanying stormtroopers and soldiers, which Derek and his team were a part of, and they'd ordered them to attack the defenseless civilians. Several of the stormtroopers actually deliberately missed their shots, not wanting to kill the civilians outright. A couple of days later, um, they read the reports and it said that there had been a rebel ambush but the troops started to suspect that's not what they had in mind and that the ISB only wanted to check the loyalty of the stormtroopers. Several days later after the massacre, Lerone and his four friends were cornered in a corridor in the ship by ISB Major Drelfin, who accused Lerone of insubordination and not following orders and then treason after he realised he deliberately missed his shots on the planet, calling him a rebel supervisor and pulling out his blaster and trying to arrest him. The trouble was, uh, stormtroopers are trained with certain reflexes and those reflexes became active. So Laroni stole the, the Major's gun and then accidentally shot him when he pulled out his second pistol to try and attack him, causing his accidental death. So his four squad mates realised that the ISB won't take too kindly to this so he decides to try and flee and they realised that all of their military careers were over and possibly their lives upon future investigations because killing a member of the ISB is a serious crime and they don't take too kindly to anyone standing by and watching it happen. So, firstly I'm going to introduce the members of the team. There was a scout trooper named Corlo Brightwater who was a scout trooper not officially attached to the unit but as he witnessed the death of him he knew he'd be implicated. Joak Quiller and a Stormtrooper pilot, quite a rarity, but they do exist, able to pilot many vehicles and also spaceships. There was also Sabaran Marcross, whose notable characteristics was he believed that duty was the most important thing, more so than power or money. Though he did understand the principle of command, he didn't really have the talent himself. And finally we come to Paxtro Grave, the unit's sniper. These five men in total now decide that they must flee the reprisal, otherwise face consequences for their actions and possibly their executions. So, pretending to be Drayfin, Lerone boards his freighter and using his command codes says they are all going on a secret ISB mission, which is not unheard of in the Imperial military being given orders from ISB members and they're not having a clue what their mission actually is. So they let them go and they let them depart. As they start exploring the freighter they realise it is decked out in lots of military grade hardware and equipment for long missions including several sets of stormtrooper armour, several sets of scout trooper armour and if memory serves from reading the book at least one set of space trooper armour. It's similar to scout and stormtrooper armour uh, combining it with the qualities of a flight suit from the TIE Fighter series, but it is more heavily armoured. They realise quite quickly that this is ship has also been heavily modified for ISB use on long missions. The problem is they realise that the food supplies aren't going to last as long as the military equipment. But they were in luck that they had plenty of credits on board thanks to the ISB. There was also the necessary equipment for creating forged identity tanks as well which means they realise quite quickly that if they wanted to, they have the enough equipment to set them up as mercenaries. However, this is where their oaths they took to the Empire came back into the forefront of their minds and didn't really feel comfortable with hiring themselves out as cr to criminals and other organisations, especially after the massacre that happened on Teardrop. That was the name of the city they attacked. 
combining this with the rumours they'd heard about the destruction of the planet Alderaan by the, at the hand of the Death Star, they were beginning to wonder if the Empire was really worth their allegiance. Now the amount of money they had on board the ship meant they could live quite comfortably for a while without having to find any work. So to low low for a little while they start heading for the planet Draunost where there is a quite small imperial presence and was controlled by consolidated shipping. The point of this was to buy fuel, food and also lay low and try and find a more permanent hiding place from the ISB. While on Draunost, Lerone and Grave went shopping and on their way back a group of farmers that were near them as they were travelling back to the ship got attacked by a swoop gang. So Lerone and Grave helped the farmers out while until the rest of the team arrived with more heavier weapons to help deal with the swoop gang. Now the reason why Lerone helped out these farmers is because he had grown up as a farmer himself and didn't like seeing them getting pushed around. Unaware that in truth that these farmers were actually smuggling weapons for the Rebel Alliance. This did force them to leave Dronost quite earlier on than they would have liked as they didn't yet have all the supplies they wanted, mostly only securing the food. But they knew the reprisal would hear word of this attack and track them down to this location. So they left. When they were leaving, they realised that they did need the proper chain of command because you can't really go into battle without somebody leading and directing each one's movements to be coordinated properly. So Lerone is then once again chosen as the unit's leader. So they move on to another planet outside of Imperial Kroll, and specifically Ranklidge. Now there was a small Imperial presence on this world, but not too big a one. Now they landed in the capital city of Janissar in order to get fuel. Now while they were here, local Imperial patrol groups attempted to shake them down but not discovering anything too suspicious. However, they did confiscate the two speeders that were on board the freighter. Something that Brightwater really didn't like because as a scout trooper that would be his primary mode of transport. Once the patrollers had gone, a local technician working at the spaceport who was refueling their ship told them of what had been happening in the city, that the new chief patroller, Cav Zarin, had been extorting everybody on docking fees and confiscating anything he saw fit, also getting rid of any patrollers who stood against him. Now this really angered Lerone and all his companions, who decided to release the city from his control. So they make a plan with anyone who is there and they get them to meet in a certain point. Lerone goes in, in civilian clothing in to talk to the chief, Carl Saren, and leaving the others on standby outside. Now, Cav Saren decided with his loyalists to just not bother and execute everybody there, and then they were easily cut down by the five stormtroopers. Once all the corrupted patrollers were dealt with, they then returned control to a previous senior officer called Colonel Atmino who in return asked for the operating numbers of each of the stormtroopers in order to give them a, comment, a commendation to their superiors, to which Lerone simply responded with, we are the hand of judgement. Now, later on after they left, this was something that they'd all teased him about as he at the time thought it was a pretty lame name, but they didn't want to give their actual operating numbers because then it would have been revealed that they were Imperial deserters. Though, after a while they realised that this is probably what they'd be known as and so the name stuck and the newly minted Hand of Judgement began operating out in the galaxy. Now, one of the things they had done is they took Chad Saren's files and he realised that there was a suspicious connection between the, him and the Swoop Gang and that they seemed to both be connected to a pirate group called the Blood Scars. So they decided to return to Draunost to learn more about them. But instead, they found one of the farmers in close conversation with a suspicious group of people that included two humans and a Wookiee. Now, they found this to be highly suspicious, so they followed the YT-3100 ship to another star system. I'm sure some of you who know a bit about ships know what ship this sounds like, but you'll find out in a moment. During this time, they actually end up becoming allies of convenience of two other pirate ships in the area as, and you probably guessed it, Han Solo had planned an ambush for a group of pirates in this system. Once the rebels were driven off and all but one of the pirate ships were destroyed, the Hand of Judgment boarded the remaining vessel and managed to capture a few pirates. 
From these pirates, they managed to learn that the Bloodscars had been gathering smaller pirate groups under their command. They also learned of an individual known as Caldra, who had been meeting with the pirate groups and their leaders. Unfortunately for the Hand of Judgment and Lerone, this information hadn't really proven to be that useful, as it kind of led to a dead end. They'd continued talking to the crew members of the YT-300 freighter, well, the Millennium Falcon, I may as well tell you at this point, uh, not realising it that they were actually talking to Han Solo and Luke Skywalker, and they also they both gave them a tip, and that information did, then did turn out to be more favourable. So working together, despite Han Solo's mistrust of their own, not realising their Imperial background, they managed to work together and track down the Bloodscars pirate base. When they arrived at the pirate base, they not only found the pirates, but they also found the reprisal, their old, old ship. Not really the best thing you want to be finding, you know, a fully armed and operational Imperial Star Destroyer. But luckily for the Hand of Judgment, they weren't actually there to deal with them. They had actually come to destroy the pirate base to destroy an Imperial agent who had infiltrated the base. The Imperial agent known as Mara Jade. Those of you who know Mara Jade know that she is the Hand of the Emperor. Now the captain of the reprisal and the ISB associate aboard wanted to destroy the pirate base to kill Myra in case she found out about the desertion of the five stormtroopers now known as the Hand of Judgment. Which to any naval commander or even an ISB agent who would not dealt with any traitors it would have been a severe threat to their career so they wanted to make sure this was covered up. Not realising that Myra was actually completely unaware of the desertion of Lerone and his friends. That was until the operations personnel had mentioned it to her, but she turned around and said, Look, I'm not really interested in runaways, my own mission takes priority. Now, while Lerone and his companions were trying to get away from the reprisal, Skywalker, Solo and Chewie were able to escape from their confinement, and then timely helped enable them to get loose from a tractor beam the reprisal had on the ship. Chewie, who was flying the Falcon by this point, Lord the reprisal after him and led it into a useless chase towards the Alderaan system. It's at this point that they discover a communication device that had been sending messages to the capital of the Shelsha system that they found this very suspicious and were going to track down. And then Luke and Han also wanted to come with them because they had learned through the Force that Leia Organa was having trouble on the planet. So despite mistrust between the group, once again they still decide to work together for the betterment of their goals. It's at this point they do learn of the other's affiliations to the Rebel Alliance and the Empire, but after some tense moments they still decide to work together for the greater good. Chewie rejoins the group shortly after hiding the Falcon as not to want to draw any unwanted attention. As they enter the main planet of the Shelska system, the planet known as Shell Conwa, they discover something quite to their surprise, the Imperial Star Dreadnought Executor. Their personal ship of Darth Vader, who appeared to arrive on planet to search for Leia personally. So this is a bit of a problem, especially seeing as the members of the Hand of Judgment realise that seeing as this is Vader, this means the 501st Legion will be with him, also known as Vader's Fist. So they decide to accompany the rebels, Han, Luke and Chewie, in order to help them find Leia so they wouldn't be caught. So at this point, Luke uses the Force to both locate Leia and also any patrols that are roaming the area so they can best avoid them. During this point, a small spaceship was shot down nearby, so Lerone decided that it was their duty to go and assist and ordered the rebels to continue on their own while they went and investigated what had happened. So inside the pod, they had found a young redhead who was fighting an ATST. This is what had shut down her ship, and she introduced herself as Jade and used a high level Imperial recognition code ordering the Hand of Judgment to help her stop the rogue ATST, which was being controlled by the pirate, Paldra. Starting to make a bit of a sense here that she's got a lot of machinations going on. Now she had deliberately arrived in system just before Jade and had commanded a group of 50 ATSTs and set them on autopilot. Once they had attempted to deal with the walkers, Chewbacca arrived with their ship and started using it as bait while Solo's group were attempting to board the ship without being noticed. Now they had found Leia and then they proceeded to help and assist in the battle and then flowing off once official Stormtrooper patrols started arriving. 
Now, Mara noticed Lerone's reluctance to identify his group, so she covered for them, claiming that they were a special unit given under her command. After this has been dealt with, she makes Lerone tell her the full story. Now, Lerone does spin half truths to not reveal to her that she, he is a military deserter. She accepts this, but in return asks that for the moment, time being, the Hand of Judgment will take orders from her. Seeing as they really had little option to this, they hastily agreed, and Macross, who had grown up in the city they were in, was chosen to guide everybody around, as well as a secret entrance to the palace grounds for the main city. Seeing as that he was the cousin of the governor's son. You can kind of see where this is going, can't you? Once he had led them to the store, Jade took command of the group once again and used her lightsaber to cut an opening in the wall. Once they had gotten inside the palace grounds, Brightwater separated from the others and headed to the main gate on his speeder bike to prevent any possible escape attempts, while Jade led the other four across the garden towards a slide door. This door opened up into the kitchen. Probably not the best idea to get a break, but this wasn't their intent. At this time, that Mara told Lerone what the mission was about. She suspected that the governor was a traitor to the Empire and believed he had been involved with pirate activities as well as having his attempt to kill Jade. Such charges would be deserving of the death penalty and Jade wanted the troopers to help her bring him to justice. While they were crossing the garden, they came across a large and what they didn't know at the time, an easily frightened, sorry, an easy flammable plant which scared the crap out of the troopers and also revealed their presence to the guards on the planet because they shot at the planet. This kind of forced Mara to improvise their planet entrance and then she was separated from the group. Troopers then tried to back through the kitchen door while Mara cut her own way through, similarly to how she did with the main wall. It was not long until Mara caught up with Cladra and learned about a group of five stormtroopers who deserted from the reprisal, and it didn't take long to put two and two together. She managed to escape the trap that Cladra had set for her, though it did mean that the entire room was set on fire. Meanwhile, Lerone and his team had made their way through the kitchens and into the main reception area where they attempted to arrest the governor to stand trial for treason. Mm, unfortunately, Macross turned against his... Sorry, Marcross had turned against his companions because it is revealed at this point that he had not told them that the governor was his uncle and he handed over his weapon to his uncle. Not realising that his uncle actually planned to secede from the Empire who then immediately pointed the gun at him. Now we learn at this point from Marcross's own internal dialogue that he's actually suspicious of his uncle's intention but he wants to see the truth with his own eyes. So we then discover that the weapon he has given to him only actually has one shot left in it and that is not going to be really be able to do anything to fully intact Imperial Stormtrooper armour. The point of their armour is it deflects energy all across the armour. It's only after that shot is dissipated the armour becomes useless. It's at this point that Mara Jade throws a mist canister into the room which distracts the governor and causes him to misfire and it saves Mara Cross's life. Once the battle is over, despite everything that transpired, Lerone demands that the group leave the governor alive, saying that he must stand trial for his crimes against the Empire. Now, it is at this point that Darth Vader and another man who wants to become the new governor enters the room. Once again, Mara, who covers for Lerone as he becomes very uneasy as they feared their desertion would be revealed. In fact, in this scene, Vader does question this and she goes, Oh, come on, Vader, you have the entire of the five O first, emphasising the O. This is my little hand of judgement. Once this tense situation has been dealt with, Mara leads the group away from Vader and his cohorts and she demands the full truth about what happened. And as she does this, she realises that they had no other choice but to do what they had done. So she promises that she will find out what happened on, in the city of Teardrop and who was responsible for the massacre of the civilians. She also says, look, you, we will let you go, but you need to stop using the name Hand of Judgment and to lay low for a while and stay out of trouble. After she leaves the group, she makes special permissions for them to leave the system. Not realising that the three rebel companions they had earlier, and now Leia, 
were hidden on board the ship. Once they leave the planet, they return the rebels to the Millennium Falcon and they go on their way. After the events that happened on Shalcon, where the Hand of Judgment lay low for the next two months. They do this by moving from place to place. Though there are certain missions and things they do take on while they were doing this when they saw the need. This did, however, take a toll on the equipment and money that the ISB had stored up on their ship. And after these two months, the group had started to consider retirement. So they decided that they had enough equipment left to take on several more missions. So they first head, start heading towards one planet where they had heard rumours of stolen elections. But on their way, they decided to stop on another planet to sort out a simple case where a group of sculptors had been forced into slave labour. Once they arrived on the planet, they immediately fell under unexpected gas attack. All five members of the group went down without seeing the shot being fired. And it turns out that it was actually the corrupt planet from the planet they were currently heading to. He'd put out the rumour about the sculptors to stop them from reaching that planet and dealing with the situation there. This is where a bit of a problem would occur, as they thought this would be the end of them. Though suddenly, Myra Jade appeared and rescued the group. And she explained that the Emperor has ordered her to find out if if Imperial Governor Bindor Feroz of the of the Kandoras sector had become a traitor to the Empire and was thus pursuing defection to the Rebel Alliance. Myra had remembered the team from their encounter early before and decided to commandeer their help on her new mission. To the Hand of Judgment it was clear that Jade would not take no for an answer, but realising that they, this, they had been planning to do something important for their land at last mission, decided to join her. And taking out a treacherous governor did kind of really work with what they were planning to do. So then they decided to approach the Polo Major capital of the Kandora sector. Quiller noted a familiar looking YT transport on a landing platform in the city, and he was correct in assuming it was the Millennium Falcon, which to Marcross only confirmed the situation that the governor was planning to defect the Rebel Alliance. Though the Hand did decide to not bother reporting this to Jade, wanting to speak to Solo first and found out what they were doing in the city. While they were walking around the city, they noticed two alien groups seemed to get into a bit of a squabble around poor quality goods and weaponsmithing. And so they interfered and were able to sort things out without bloodshed. This allowed things to calm down a little bit. The aliens gave Lerone a knife that they had forged to help defend their people. Lerone in turn gave this to Brightwater who had gained a fondness for collecting souvenirs. The next day, Mara Jade had Lerone and Marcross masquerade themselves as part of the Governor's Stormtrooper Force. With the help of these two, they should then infiltrate the planet's ground and pretend to be a prisoner who the Stormtroopers suspected of shoplifting. While they were doing this, the rest of the hand would stand guard outside. And they, at this point, they saw a flash riot that happened when an unsuspecting Luke Skywalker got blamed for murdering the governor, who was in fact still alive, which was a little odd. Hearing about the riot through their comlinks, Rolone ordered the others to rescue the young Jedi just before the riot started outside. At this point, Jade had reached the governor's office and had overheard a conversation that told her that the governor's family had been kidnapped in order to force him to make a deal with the Rebel Alliance. There, it then turned out that this kidnapping had actually been done by the warlord who had conquered the planet of the aliens who Lerone broke up in the market just earlier. While this was going on, Brightwater managed to carry Luke safely away from the riot and he also mentioned the warlord and explained that the reason why the Rebel Alliance were even in the system was because they wanted to deal with the Warlord before he became too much of a problem. As the riot had spread throughout the palace as well, they were kind of pinned down and the governor was starting to panic. Now, Jade had decided not to press the issue with the governor, realising what situation he was in. Now, the attackers were closing in on them and they were trapped until Lerone and the rest of the hand arrived and Mara was able to discover the entry to the governor's escape tunnel. Now, the governor, moments before, had actually fallen unconscious due to an injury he had sustained to his head. Travelling down this escape route, which led to the sewers, brings them up into the basement of the Whistling Wind, which is a tap calf. Uh, tap calves are sort of like uh, mini bars or canteens, 
that serve various functions from serving drinks to anything. You, you should all know what a canteen is by this point. But anyway, swiftly moving on, uh, the rest of the members of the Hand of Judgment joined them here in defence of the Governor. Now, what they did then is they set up the Governor and then they gave him a set of Stormtrooper armour just in case they were found, just so he would help calm it down. At this point, Marajade left the Hand of Judgment to go and find out where the family was being held for the Governor so they could retrieve them and then things could get back to normal. Well, I wouldn't say back to normal exactly, there would be some repercussions for all of this. An Imperial Governor who can't keep control of his planet or his system is of no use to the Emperor. While this was happening, Luke contacted Lavrone using a comlink he had found left behind by Brightwater due to his own comlink being destroyed during the riot that happened earlier. Axion, a rebel negotiator and agent who had joined up with the group during the incident that was going on in the Governor's Palace, demanded that Luke Skywalker come and join them. All of this despite Lerone's protests. Now, Axion insisted that Luke come to them, did actually arouse some suspicion with Grave, who had uh, heard how people that during the riot had claimed that Luke had killed the Governor with a lightsaber. At this point, as Grave and some of the other troopers started to access some issues to Axion, he'd realised he'd been discovered. At this point he pulls out his pistol, starts to shoot at Grave and Quilla, uh, which is very unexpected. It catches Lerone completely by surprise. Only Marcos had the reaction to pull up his gun at the time that this happened. However, Axiomon quickly shot it out of his hands and took complete control of the situation. The Hand of Judgment at this point was pretty much rendered useless to stop him. As with all bad guys in these situations, once Axiomon had realised he was in charge of the situation, he began listing his plans to the Hand of Judgment, a sense monologuing. During this time, the Governor had regained consciousness, and you learn that Axiomon, um, Axion, sorry, I keep mispronouncing that, Axiomon was under the impression that Senior Captain Fraun, you all know who that is, had been, direct, had been directing Grand Moff Tarkin, and that the destruction of Elderon by the Death Star was via his recommendation. Mm. If you do your research on Fraun, you know that would be completely not his style. Anyway, getting back to it. This was an all part of an elaborate plan to lure the Chiss officer into a trap, using the governor's assassination as an attempt to bait him into coming, to which the rebel representative even admitted to being the one who actually shot the governor earlier in the engagement in the palace. So Brightwater currently patch patches up his two wounded comrades and then moves to stand with the other two. He also manages to pull the knife out without Aximon noticing while he's busy on his comlink, waiting for the best opportunity for this to basically be useful so he could try and stab him I suppose. While this was going on the governor had uh, gotten a bottle of spirits down from the shelf behind him and Lerone begins conversing with him to distract him from what the Governor is doing. You learned at this point that the Warlord had convinced the Rebel Agent that if the Chit de Fraun had been killed and the, uh, as the Governor assassinated, he would then bring his troops to aid the Rebel Alliance after this. Now, Aximon was blinded by his anger at the destruction of Alderaan, and so he was quite easy to fall for this. Now, the overall goal of this was to bring Thrawn into the system and then ambush him. Now, this plan as it's detailed out in the book, you, you sit there and you think that Thrawn, knowing what we know of Thrawn, would rarely work this out. But again, this is told from the perspectives of the Rebel Agent and the Hand of Judgment, so they might not necessarily pick up on that. And this was generally a time before Thrawn's military might and genius was well respected from the Empire. Alright, getting back to the book. Uh, while this was going on, the governor had finally managed to work one of the bottles free from the cabinet. But unfortunately, as Sod's Law has to intervene, one of the pieces of Stormtrooper armor that was covering him for extra protection slipped at this very moment, causing Aximon's attention to be distracted. He turned away from the Uh Brightwater then slid the knife from across the room to Quilla, being the closest to Aximon who then proceeded to bury it in Axiomon's chest, killing him. Lerone quickly grabbed the comlink that he had and contacted Luke and asked that he stay away from their hiding place so that one of Axiomon's agents wouldn't be able to track Luke to the hideout, um, which Luke corrects him and says that the, uh, the actual opposite 
is happening. He'd spotted one of these goons and had tailored him back to where the stormtroopers were hidden. Once this call had finished, Larone then contacted the rebellion, much to the surprise and resistance from the other members of the hand, just to inform them of Axiomon's betrayal and also to contact Chewbacca at the spaceport and ask him to bring them to, to a back to tank so that things that needed healing could be healed. This was mostly grave as he was in need of urgent medical attention after what had happened earlier. While this was going on, the rest of the members of the Hand of Judgment prepared their defences as Axmon's goons were closing in on their position, trailing them behind them. Jade was nowhere to be seen as she was still currently looking for leads on the governor's family. So this left them there to hold the line and keep the governor alive. On a side note of this, Lerone sent Brightwater out to try and find the aliens that they'd helped out before, going to go and call in their favour and also maybe get some payback against the Warlord's goons. Not long after this, Chewbacca arrived at the back to tank and Lerone gave Axion's body to Chewie in exchange and Brightwater then returned with their allies. Quilla gave some quick tips and training on how to use blaster weapons and stormtrooper tactics to the aliens. Once this was done, they would have to wait and see how things would develop. During this time, Jade had found her way to the kidnappers and reported the size of the opposing force. The governor at this point decided to help Jade by luring away some of the guards from his family by contacting them and gave away the position. This was to the horror of the hand. They were the ones putting their lives on the line to protect the governor. Now the no governor contacted Major Pakri, who was an Imperial officer was stationed in this sector and it was suspected by the hand of judgment that he was in fact actually a traitor. Uh, he was actually working for the warlord all along. Though the governor did veil this as though pretending to ask for help, though as not to let the Major's ruse be know that he'd been discovered. And so they didn't really need to wait too long for anyone to come and strike their defences. Thankfully though, because they had plenty of time to prepare, they managed to survive this first assault with relative ease. So after a few minutes of light engagement, uh, they sent the enemies running outside of a jamming device they'd set up to kind of jam the hands comlink so they could go and then call for backup. The next wave came equipped unfortunately with a e-web heavy repeating blaster. I'll be doing a video on those at some point. And Fortunately, they did manage to survive thanks to uh, their preparations and various, but one of their alien allies did in fact die, sacrificing himself to protect Lerone. It was after this incident that Grave, in his back to tank, suddenly just regained consciousness. Now, he was still in quite bad shape, but he wanted to participate and help defend the rest of his team. Got himself into position and got ready for what was to come. Now, the next wave it came down from the supply lift that was in the tap calf something that they had fully expected to happen and because the enemies expected that Grave would still be out of action because he was in the back to tank they were completely caught by surprise when several of their number got picked off as this guy reached out of the tank and shot them all full of holes can't keep a good stormtrooper down even if they can't shoot to save their lives in the movies they certainly can when there is no heroes around the enemy had sent in three to four waves of attacks, each one of them repelled, and at this point they realised that they'd meet an impenetrable defence. So they decided to go with the next best thing and blow the entire place to smithereens. This would have essentially buried the Hand and their allies alive as they were in the basement. Not realising it that their alien allies had uh, been gathering up reinforcements of their own. Now these reinforcements had snuck around the enemy preparations, their jamming tower, and then turned it off. It was noted by the Hand of Judgment, remembering the lessons from the farmers who were smuggling weapons earlier. Yeah, because uh, they actually discovered that they thought about the farmers later on, due to some of their contacts they'd gained in the Rebel Alliance. That was a silly move on the Rebel Alliance's part. Anyway, getting back to it. That, them to handle this situation with such... Um, Competency made them suspicious that they weren't the refugees that they had been led to believe. And then they were joined by the leader of the aliens, um, I believe I mentioned his name earlier as uh, Vanatar. And he made it very clearly that he wanted the hand very clear that he wanted the hand of judgment to follow him. 
He also revealed that he knew who they were, and the information they seemed to possess forced Lerone and his friends to come with them to meet their mysterious master. I will note at this point in the book, it was when I became very suspicious that these aliens were actually Norgri in disguise, but it's never actually confirmed if they are the Norgri or not. It's at this point Lerone speaks up for the group and says that he might not be willing to go with them, and Vanatar kind of explains that there is, it makes it very clear that there is no choice. He was ready to use violence if it became necessary, but he'd prefer that they came with him willingly. So, the Hand of Judgment makes sure that the governor is safe, and then Lerone and his friends proceed to go with Vanitar's group to the spaceport, and they board a vessel that they don't recognise. It's a very unknown type. And then Lerone begins to ask a lot of questions about the mysterious master, something that Vanitar is still remaining very mysterious about and keeping his identity quite, quite concealed. While en route to their destination, Graves and Quilla's wounds are patched up, and eventually it is revealed that they have boarded the Star Destroyer, a Dominator. Uh, those of you who know who the command of the captain of that would be Senior Captain Fraun. Uh, he had realized what was going on, and he'd sent these soldiers there to have a look and also try and recruit the Hand of Judgment if he could, but much to Lerone and the rest of the team's surprise, he didn't want them to join the rest of his regular stormtroopers. This being as he knew well aware what had happened with the ISB and everything up to this point, he didn't want the ISB to know where they had gone. Instead, Fraun wanted them to train a new generation of stormtroopers for his shadow empire that he was building in the unknown regions. Uh, this is another name for the Empire of the Hand, the project that Palpatine allowed Thrawn to build in the Unknown Regions. That will be getting its own video. Um, and he explained to the Hand of Judgment that this version of the Empire didn't discriminate against aliens and also would be training them as regular field stormtroopers, as well as various other roles. Now, some of them were hesitant to do this at first, but after hearing about the threats that potentially could lurk in the Unknown Regions, foreshadowing of the Yuuzhan Vong, and various other problems that were there, according to Fraun, some of which were even worse than the Warlord in the local area of space, they all joined up and accepted the invitation. Once the matter was suggested, uh, Grave suggested that they, rena they name their new unit the 501st Legion because they had always been the best of the best. When the others asked him about why he decided to choose this, he claimed that they should always aim high with their new team, and so their designation became the 501st, citing, citing that this would help them to do that, and it would be a high grade for them to aim for. It was something that Fraun had agreed with, stating that they were the best of the best, so it was good to aim high. Now, the only real person who had a bit of a sore spot when it came to doing this was Brightwater. Uh, though when asked about this he explained that when he had left equipment behind for Luke to borrow he would left his lucky coin in the utility belt he had and he'd much rather have had that for their new journey. After this they set up on their new journey and they start to train new regiments of stormtroopers and this is where the Empire of the Hand really truly started beginning. It's nice to see that Fraun was still building various bits and pieces for it even in this early stage. I will be covering a separate video on the Hand of Thrawn at some point, and the Emperor of the Hand, Emperor of the Hand. Now, the disappearance of the Hand of Judgment actually did have a profound effect on Mara Jade. She found that she was missing the, them, as well as the potential asset they could have been. Now, she did actually go and take their vehicle, their, their ship, and kept it for herself, uh, with the one day of hoping that she could return it to them. Now, normally, if she was following her strict Imperial Doctrine, she would have returned it to the ISB, so this is nice to see there's just a little bit of a rebellion in Jade, even at this early stage, though her Imperial duty would keep her from mourning or looking for the Stormtrooper group. So guys, uh, this was my first attempt at doing a character breakdown slash book breakdown. Um, this was mostly two books, I think. I can't quite remember if it was or wasn't. Uh, I'll have that there for the sources. But uh, please feel free to let me know what you thought. Uh, please feel free to like, comment and subscribe. Share this around if you like what you heard. 
and, and also check the bell for notifications to stay up with any future updates of the channel. As always, there will be my sources listed below in the description. And yeah, I think that's pretty much everything. And I hope you have a good day and take care. See you on the next episode of The Lost Archives.